Well, ag again, good morning. Uh, this is uh, the second of our fireside chats. Uh, I am um, uh, Jack Murphy, the, the chair of the, the uh, Improvement Network. Uh, the last meeting that we had was with a member of the Federal Reserve who talked about a very complicated situation that keeps people almost in some cases unknowingly in, in poverty. Those of us who uh, deal with people when they're in need uh, will frequently hear somebody, I don't understand, I've got a job, I don't know why I can't make ends meet. Uh, and they start scrimping and saving and they're, they're not realizing that as they rise up the career ladder, the salary ladder, uh, they're starting to lose benefits slowly. Um, and uh, those that loss of benefits uh, for the child care or the earned income tax credit, those are sort of hidden. They, 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 they don't seem to be very apparent. You just can't figure out why I can't, I can't make ends meet. So um, that was a, a very important uh, conversation that we had. And I think today's is going to be just as, as important. I um, will now, uh, I'm looking at the run of show that Samantha has put together and it's a very tight ship. So I am turning it over to her. Uh, in uh, at the appointed time. Uh, Samantha is the co-chair along with Michelle of our one of our five work groups. Hers is dealing with transportation, which is why she's the host this, this, this morning. Uh, and she has been a great help for us. She came to us from Georgia Commute Options. So Sam, please take it away. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Jack. And thank you everyone for joining us here this morning. It's my pleasure to moderate this conversation. Um, my work with Georgia Commute Options has given me the opportunity to meet and work with businesses, community organizations, and local government um, on transportation solutions for their workforce. And I'm glad to be joined with such an esteemed panel, really. Um, they are doing exceptional work around uh, workforce mobility and transportation solutions for North Fulton and um, really the, the Atlanta region at large, um, just with the impact of, of the work that they're doing. Um, so today we will discuss traffic and the pandemic, um, transportation options, workforce commute, and the future of mobility uh, in particular in, in North Fulton. Uh, we will wrap up with the Q&A session open to everyone. Um, so if you've got any questions, please feel free to submit them using the chat box on the bottom menu bar. I'm going to share my screen if possible um, to walk us through a presentation and some slides we've prepared. So let me... Grab control of the screen. Perfect. Can everyone see? So uh, joining us today, I'd like to introduce you to our wonderful panel. Um, first, we'll have Amelia Nickerson with First Step Staffing, um, as well as Kristen Winsler with North Fulton Improvement District, and Michelle Clark with State Farm. Uh, so Amelia joined First Step Staffing um, in January 2018 and was appointed a CEO in May of 2020. Amelia has more than a decade of experience as a fundraiser, volunteer, and board member of non four nonprofits across the Southeast. She previously served as the Vice President of Development and Community Relations at First Step, managing fundraising and community relations for all of First Step's current markets, as well as assisting and with recent expansion opportunities. Uh, prior to joining First Step, Amelia worked with an as an associate director at Cokes Curry and Associates, uh, managing capital uh, campaigns, feasibility studies, and general counseling, um, excuse me, general consulting engagements for a range of clients, including the Atlanta Women's Foundation, Fulton County Schools, Georgia World Congress Center, the Centennial Olympic Park, Bobby Dodd's Golf Course, and Navicent health foundation. 
Uh, prior to joining Cokes Curry, Amelia served as the fundraising consultant for a documentary project for the Georgia Broadcasting, uh, Georgia Public Broadcasting and the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra titled Robert Shaw, A Man of Many Voices. It was a film of the life, legacy, and music of legendary conductor Robert Shaw. Her career also includes positions with the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, Woodruff Art Center, John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts in Washington, D.C., and the Peace Center for Performing Arts in Greensville, South Carolina, with a focus on donor, research, donor research and corporate and fundraising, foundation fundraising. Amelia serves as the Workforce uh, Fulton Board and is Chair of Strategic Partnership Committee, um, as well as a Metro Atlanta Exchange for Workforce Development Provider Council. Um, Amelia has also served as a president of the Board of Anti-Prejudice Consor Consortium and past chair of the annual Power Over Prejudice Summit. She was also named Fidelity Bank Volunteer of the Year by um, the Junior League of Atlanta in 2013. She and her daughter are members of the National Charity League. She's originally from Savannah and a graduate of both St. Vincent Academy and Furman University. She currently lives in Roswell, Georgia with her husband, Sean, and three children. Uh, welcome, Amelia. And next, I'd like to introduce- oh, Well, thank you, Sam. I normally don't read my own bio that much. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's it's interesting to have it all read back to you um, and see that windy path that landed me as the uh, CEO of the largest nonprofit staffing agency in the country. So <laughs> thanks for doing that. Thanks for having me No on. problem. Thank you so much for joining. <laughs> And next, I'd like to introduce Kristen Rome Winsler, the program director of the North Fulton Improvement, excuse me, the North Fulton Community Improvement District, the North Fulton CID. Uh, Ms. Winsler manages the daily operations, projects, and consulting teams of the North Fulton CID. She has been with the CID since starting as a project assistant in 2012. Prior to joining the CID, Ms. Winsler received a dual master's degree in public administration and business administration from Kennesaw State University. Her graduate research work has been published in Public Performance and Management Review. She has also served as an intern for the Associate County uh, Commissioners of Georgia and the uh, Arthritis Foundation uh, Southeast Region, both in Atlanta. Ms. Winsler is a graduate of several leadership programs, including the Atlanta Regionals Commission, uh, Commission's Region, Regional Leadership Institute and the Greater North Fulton Chamber of Commerce Leadership North Fulton. She has been a member of Women, in, of Women Transportation Seminar since 2013 and served as the Board of Directors as Vice President of Membership. She also graduated from WTS's Mentor Protege Program in 2016. In April of 2017, Ms. Winsler was awarded the Jin Lan Rising Star Award for the, by the Greater North Fulton Chamber of Commerce at their Women in Business event. In her spare time, Ms. Winsler is involved with the Boy Scouts of America as an advisor for the Venture Crew Youth Development Program. She lives in Woodstock with her husband and three daughters. Hello, Kristen. Hi, thank you. And you're right, Amelia, it's very odd to <laughs> sit here and listen to your, your life get read out. So uh, thank you for having me. I'm glad to have you here. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Michelle Clark. Michelle is a certified facilities manager, administrative service, technical service, operations supervisor, and transit coordinator for State Farm Insurance. She has worked for State Farm for 32 plus years and was instrumental in, in the stand up of approximately 2 million square feet of office space at Park Center for State Farm. Michelle graduated from Georgia State University, go Panthers, uh, with a Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy. In addition to her CFM, she holds the following insurance designations, Associate in Insurance Services and Associate in General Insurance. Michelle has been an active member of the International Facilities Management Association, the IFMA, um, Atlanta chapter since 2009. She is currently serving as secretary and chair of IFMA Atlanta Workplace. 
She has also served in various other boards and chair positions for the Atlanta chapter, including president. She was a recipient of the 2015 Martha C. Osborne CFM Award and the 2017 Distinguished Members Award. Michelle was selected by the Association of Commuter Transportation in 2017 National, uh, National Transportation Coordinator of the Year. She is actively involved in assisting State Farm employees with the use of alternative transportation and has spearheaded this work for the past eight years. Michelle is currently serving as co-chair of the North Fulton Improvement Network, our Board of um, Transportation. And Michelle has three children, age 20, which is Connor, and two 16-year-olds, Rachel and Tyler. In her spare time, she loves gardening, reading, traveling, and following all of her children's activities, especially football and softball. Again, thank you all for joining us here today. I'm, like I, I told you, it was a very distinguished panel, so I'm, I'm very glad to, to have this conversation with you all. Um, I'm going to give each of our panelists a panelist a, a chance to um, tell us a little bit more about our about their transportation uh, programs and um, the mobility work they've been doing in their respective organizations. Um, so next I'm going to turn it over to Amelia. Great, thank you. So I see a few familiar names um, on the call today. I see Mark um, from Fulton County. So hi Mark and others that I've met before in my path around Atlanta. Um, I'll tell you a little bit for the new folks about First Step, who we are, what we do, and then how transportation weaves into that mission. But as I mentioned briefly before, First Step is now the largest nonprofit staffing agency in the country. We were founded here in Atlanta in 2007. We've expanded over the last five years into five other states. We have locations in Nashville, Philadelphia, New Jersey, Orlando, and three offices in Southern California, um, and on our path to expand beyond that. Our focus is really on hiring three target populations. So for us, that's men and women experiencing homelessness, veterans, and returning citizens as a way to reconnect them to the workforce so that they can earn income that makes housing sustainable. Um, you can go to the next slide, Sam. So like I said, our mission is really income and employment focused. Um, our founder, a gentleman named Greg Block, who he sadly lost to cancer just a couple months ago, found him first step because he had talked with the mayor of Atlanta at that time, it was Shirley Franklin, and did some due diligence around our homelessness continuum of care services in the region. And the thing that was missing, as it is quite honestly in every city that we're in and others that we should be in, is a focus on income employment. Um, I don't know how many people have read, like I do, the newest report from the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. There's some mixed reviews on that. There's some pushback on Housing First. Um, but the thing that I do appreciate is a focus to look beyond just the housing model and what we need to do to help support true self-sufficiency. And as anyone on this call can attest to, one way to do that is making sure that people have access to good quality jobs and income. So that's really the lane that we focus in. Next slide. So again, this is, as it states, you know, housing ends homelessness, but income and employment make sure that that homelessness can be permanently ended as you build somebody's capacity towards self-sufficiency. Next slide. So the thing that we've learned, one, jobs are important, that income is important. Two, that jobs are a lot more than income, right? Jobs provide a sense of self-esteem, a sense of purpose. I mean, how much of your identity do you identify with the job and the work that you do in the community and giving you that sense of purpose and place to go every day and make it a contribution? So we know that jobs are a lot more than income. For first step, we know that, that there was a reason that a lot of the folks that we work with had those barriers to employment. The biggest barrier, quite honestly, is always criminal backgrounds. So second chance hiring is a huge initiative at first step. A lot of the people we hire have criminal backgrounds. At this point, it's about 40% of the 1,700 number of people we work with on a weekly basis. Um, but the other two barriers, and we've tackled one, we haven't managed to tackle the other, are transportation and childcare. And we know that with the right support, we can help our folks not just obtain a job, but hopefully retain that job and then take that first step into a career pathway. So transportation, almost from the beginning of when First Step started in 2007, has been part of the ecosystem of the services that we offer. And I'll go into that in one second. You can go to the next slide. 
So this is a, a snapshot of what we'll be doing in 2020, even with the effects of COVID that we're all feeling. But at this point, we'll have over 4,000 men and women who are homeless we've connected to work. We're focused, like I said, on those supportive services and job retention. Jobs mean wages. For us, that means 42 million in paid wages. And this last bullet point, 120,000 rides given to and from work. So like I said, transportation is obviously a tremendous barrier to employment. It's why you're having this panel. It's why we're having these conversations. Um, and at the time, we decided to take that internally. There really weren't enough options with public transportation, with access to being able to buy a car, with the, where our folks were, that transportation was something we were going to have to run internally. So First Step essentially runs a miniature transportation program. We've run our own vans. We partnered with Uber. We still have that partnership. I'll be honest, it's real expensive, particularly right now. It's not very efficient way for us to move people. And by far the best way that we have found to start to transport our individuals, and we're doing it now in all states, is a program with Rideshare with Enterprise. Rideshare is basically a souped up carpool program that a lot of car rental companies will have contracts with DOT for. Enterprise happens to be our partner. Essentially, they will rent a vehicle up to a 15 passenger van. They get a subsidy from DOT to enroll that vehicle as a rideshare program. So where it may cost $1,500 a month to rent a van, we can rent it for $1,200 a month and they get that $300 subsidy from DOT. And you have to have approved routes and approved volunteer drivers, but you now have access to those vehicles. And for us, the fact that it covers maintenance and insurance on a vehicle, so there's a, a lowering of the risk associated with the transportation, which is a high workers' comp rate for those of us that have to do transportation on a regular basis. It covers those things, and in some states, you even get a gas card with it. So at this point, we run about 20 vans, um, do about 3,000 rides a week, if not more, just depending on the week. It is a direct transport from one of our office locations to a job site. And then depending on time of day when they're coming back, either dropping back off at public transportation or taking people directly to where they're staying, if public transportation is no longer running. The reason we do that is we have a lot, a lot of people, like I said, 1,700 people a week go into work who are ready and willing to work. They just can't access the jobs that are out there, whether it's a time of geography and public transportation isn't an option, particularly right now when public transportation is being cut or it's a, time, it's a timing issue. So if you have people working second and third shift, if they get off at two o'clock in the morning, which are usually better paying jobs, which is a really good thing, they can't get public transportation home. So that's what we do. Happy to answer more questions as we get into the panel, but transportation is absolutely part of helping us achieve that mission of putting people to work and making sure they have the income and what they need to get to self-sufficiency. So thank you. These are our people. Y'all can look at those later, but those are a lot of numbers. I always like to have some faces because the faces are really what drives what we do. I definitely understand that. Um, and thank you so much for that information. Uh, next, I will turn it over to Kristen. Hey, y'all. Uh, good, I guess, kind of morning. Uh, uh, thank you again for uh, letting me uh, join uh, today. It's a it's a really important conversation and we talk about it all the time uh, in, our, in our daily lives because it's what we do, um, but it's nice to see other people you know, realize how important it is as well. Um, so if you go ahead and go to the first slide, Sam. Um, so the North Fulton Community Improvement District, and I tried to limit my number of slides and, and information. So let me know if, you, if I'm going too fast or you have any additional questions. But um, so uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, a community, community improvement district, there are about 26 in the metro Atlanta area. We are uh, the North Fulton district. Um, we cover uh, Roswell, Alfreda, and Milton, uh, some of those cities. Uh, so what a CID is, we are a group of commercial property owners that pay a, a very slight incremental uh, property tax um, voluntarily in order to invest in the infrastructure uh, of the area. So that could be, um, and again, it depends on the area that you're in and what the needs are. Um, but in North Fulton, our need obviously is traffic, mobility, transportation. So um, we do uh, bridge replacements, uh, greenway connections. Uh, we invest in uh, roadway connections, sidewalk, trails, you know, you, you name it, anything uh, that we can do to help get kind of that mobility, uh, those transportation options to some of the um, employers and employees in the area. Um, so since its inception, uh, which was in 2003, uh, we have spent about $23 million and we have brought uh, about $130 million in total 
to the district. And again, that's in the form of transportation infrastructure projects. Um, and which, what's great is a lot of that funding is funding that would not have come to our area without without uh, these, without our initial investment. So it's a great partnership. Um, I've had some pictures here of some of the projects that we've done in the past. I hope when you're driving around North Fulton, you uh, drive by a lot of our projects. Uh, you may not know we were involved, which is absolutely fine, um, but we were, we helped and partnered with the cities, with the state, um, even the county at some point uh, to get uh, some great projects out. Um, so if you look at some of the pictures, uh, we did the four interchanges in the city of Alpharetta, all of that uh, landscaping and hardscaping uh, off of uh, Haynes Bridge Road, Old Milton Parkway, Wimmer Parkway, and Mansell Road. Uh, we did uh, those interchanges and we partnered with the city to maintain those as well. Um, it adds a, a great, it's a great bang for our buck, a lot of economic value, uh, a great uh, gateway to the area. Um, we also, a couple of years ago, we opened the Encore Parkway bridge replacement and streetscape. Um, and that also included a greenway connection. Um, if you saw the old bridge, it was it was a little sad looking and GDOT was gonna replace the bridge because um, it needed to be replaced, but they were gonna replace it with no sidewalks, no greenway connection. Uh, so the CID was able to step in along with several partners, including GDOT, um, the State Road and Tollway Authority, uh, a, lot of, a lot of partners, including the city of Alpharetta. Uh, and we were able to build uh, that beautiful bridge that's at the top right, right there. Um, and it also, again, includes a greenway connection uh, to the North Point Parkway, uh, right behind uh, where the Eaton Allen Furniture is. Uh, there's a, a greenway, a Big Creek Greenway trailhead, and we were able to connect to that uh, to get some of those businesses um, around North Point Mall uh, over there. Um, so again, lots of projects. I won't go into all of them, um, but again, we've been around for a long time, so we've done a lot of stuff. So I'm happy to go into more detail about any of those if anyone has any questions or if you wanna talk offline later. Again, happy to talk your ear off about the CID. Um, if you wanna to go to the next slide really quick. I just wanna, I think, yeah, that's our map. So just to show you where we are, we can only spend money within our district. And so that that is our current district. Again, uh, we hit the cities of Alfreda, Roswell and Milton. Um, and then there's actually a CID over at Perimeter as well uh, that goes into Sandy Springs and Dunwoody uh, too. Um, and the next slide. Um, and these are some of our current projects that we're working on. If you've been up uh, to Windward Parkway and you see all the construction going on there, uh, we're part of that project. We actually have the ribbon cutting uh, next month. So we're very excited about getting that done. I'm sure everyone is excited about getting that done. Um, we also have a couple of um, roadway extensions, uh, Davis Drive and Old Ellis. Um, we're also um, partnering with the city uh, to help with the Alpha Loop. Uh, that's kind of, uh, if you're not familiar, that is Alpharetta's uh, kind of mini version of the Beltline. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty cool uh, amenity that they're trying to uh, bring and kind of connect a lot of uh, big commercial areas within the city. So it's a great idea and we've uh, helped fund some of the design as well as now we're looking at hopefully moving forward with partnering on some of the construction of that. Um, and some of it is already built out as well. Um, but again, we can only spend money within our district. Um, and some of that is outside. Um, we also have partnered with the city um, when the State Route 400 road, uh, extent, uh, excuse me, when the State Route 400 uh, comes up and they do the extension of the uh, expressway, uh, express lanes, uh, we have partnered with the city of Alpharetta so that when they tear down the bridges and rebuild them, I think there's three bridges, there's two bridges they're rebuilding and one new one. Um, they're rebuilding Kimball Bridge Road and Webb Bridge Road. Um, or Web, Quimble Bridge, excuse me, and Webb Bridge, and then also uh, a new bridge, which we call Tradewinds Parkway. And when they rebuild those, they're gonna look um, really beautiful. They're gonna have sidewalks. There's gonna be a greenway connection. Um, so again, uh, specifically on Webb Bridge, um, but again, just kind of enhancing what is gonna go there. Instead of just building a bridge, we're gonna build something that is more, uh, offers more uh, mobility options. Um, and then also, uh, we're also doing a, a bus shelter program right now. Um, we approved it last year and we're starting uh, to build the bus shelters now. Um, right now, I think there's five that we're building. Um, we worked with the city of Alpharetta and Marta to come up with a standard Alpharetta bus shelter um, because Marta Oaks can build some shelters and then uh, the city cities have built some um, and they all kind of have a little bit disjointed. So we came up with kind of a standard uh, that's comparable to the Marta shelter um, that will be uh, building and we're actually going to be uh, building five of them uh, in, uh, on some needed areas, um, hopefully more needed as, as the public transit picks back up. So um, again, just some of our current projects, happy to go through more of those uh, with you later if you have questions. Um, next slide, please. Um, um, and I did want to just go through really quick um, as part of uh, 
part of what we're doing now with, with COVID. Obviously, transportation uh, construction, uh, we're able to get a lot done, which has been great. And we've been moving forward and coming, you know, coming in early on a few things, which has been fantastic, uh, kind of a silver lining, silver lining uh, to uh, people not being in the offices. Um, but we did do um, a really quick survey with some of our property owners and property managers just to kind of um, understand what they're going through, find out if there's any help that we can offer. Um, and obviously what came of that is people are asking for lower rents, people are asking for, you know, lease changes, things like that, which is, you know, very common right now. Um, but we were able to connect with a couple of uh, property owners uh, specifically and actually help them with a couple of programs. We actually connected them to Georgia Commute Options in one case as well. Um, so again, uh, trying to do what we can, reach out, make sure our owners know that we're here to, to assist them and hopefully help them out. Um, and then the next slide, last slide, I promise. Um, just a, a snapshot of our partners, because it's so important. We could not do what we do without all of the support of the cities, um, the chamber, I saw Mark's on the call, um, George Commute Options, uh, Greta, CERTA, all those fun acronym state agencies. Uh, we work really well with them, ARC. Um, and we've been very lucky uh, to do so. So we're, we're excited to be here. We're excited to continue to get infrastructure built um, and help people get to their jobs, help people get home, help people um, just move around and get where they need to go. As Jack said, kind of at the beginning of the call, which is a great point, transportation is about moving people and getting them where they need to go. So, um, all right, I guess that's it for me. Again, I'm happy to answer questions on the panel. And if you wanna talk offline, you know, obviously you're more than welcome to reach out. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think that all of this is going to tie in really well as we talk about the different modes that we, you guys are really bringing to the region. And last but certainly not least, uh, State Farm, Michelle, if you would. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, the uh, slide that Sam has brought up is our new uh, Atlanta hub here in the perimeter area. Um, and at State Farm, just for everyone's knowledge, I mean, obviously, most people know who State Farm is, right? Um, and our mission is to help people manage the risks of everyday life and recover from the unexpected and realize their dreams. But one of, part of that is also bringing a diverse pool of employees with their talents and experiences to our company in order to provide the best service for our customers across the country. So this location here in Atlanta, we have been working on this. Um, I've been privileged to be a part of this project for the last eight years. Um, we decided at our corporate headquarters um, probably about a decade ago now to consolidate into three major hubs in our corporate headquarters. Um, and Atlanta was chosen as one of those locations. Um, good for me um, and a lot of other people. Uh, Dallas and Phoenix are our other two locations that are, are similar to this here in Atlanta. So for those of you that live in and or near uh, the perimeter and have been all in a dither for the last several <laughs> years about construction due to State Farm, we are about to be done. So um, I'm very thankful for that. But this campus is beautiful, as you can see. Um, it's comprised of about two million plus square feet of uh, rentable square feet, which we do um, have there at the campus. Um, and hopefully we'll be back too soon. As I indicated earlier, um, when I was talking to Janelle, who's on the call, um, I'll be coming back in the office next week. Yay for me. Um, Cause I'm tired of looking at this dining room every day. Um, but this has been a very vibrant project and uh, lucky to be a part of it. So over the past eight years, we have migrated and hired and consolidated down into the perimeter area, as well as retained a presence up in Johns Creek. Um, but we stood up these short-term locations all around the perimeter area here in anticipation of coming into this main hub location that's point down the road, which we're at now. Um, during that period of time, our, part of our concerns were, well, how do we get our people from the transit hub that we are looking at here at the Dunwoody Station in the interim of building this location? 
So one of the things that you'll hear me talk about when some of the Q&A comes up is what were those short-term solutions? And part of that was shuttle services, like Amelia was talking about earlier. Um, how do we get people that last mile connectivity? Um, and we wanted to do all that to make it as easy as possible for us to attract uh, and retain a diverse workforce uh, for the future of State Farm and continue our leadership in the financial and insurance market. So if you'll go to the next slide. Um, so we built this huge campus and the building here on the foreground on the right is our Park Center uh, Building One. Um, and as you can see, the MARTA train is running right next to our building. So as part of this construction project, we were very fortunate to partner with uh, our developer, KDC, our construction company, Holder, and MARTA, uh, along with the city of Dunwoody and the PCID for Perimeter Community Improvement District, similar to North Fulton Community Improvement District with Kristen. Um, and we all came together to see how can we connect this right to our front door. Um, the station is obviously right across the street, but we didn't want our folks to have to cross the street, hold up traffic, make it more difficult for them to get into the buildings. We partnered with MARTA and we built a platform, as you'll see, right where you go under the parking deck there. I'm using my hands like y'all can tell where I'm going, right? But <laughs> if you'll, uh, when you're looking at that, you come down on a platform on that side of the building and you walk right into the lobby of our building one. Um, if I think if you go to the back of slide, Sam, for me, um, when you come out of building one, and you can see over to where the flags are in the background over there toward building one, there's a bridge and that bridge is over the top of Perimeter Center Parkway, which enables our folks coming off of the platform into the lobby of building one to cross over to our other two buildings without again, ever having to get on street level and tie up traffic. Um, and so that helps with mobility of our people once they get here um, and really helps the area to keep down with congestion and tying up red lights and things like that for people having to cross the street. Um, although we did work with the PCID to improve some of those measures as well, because we do have a lot of people taking buses into the area as well. So Sam, if you can go forward for me two times, that would be awesome. So here's another feature that we utilize at State Farm to help with that mobility options. These uh, screens are located, they're quite large in our lobbies of each of our buildings to basically give our employees real-time traffic updates. Um, so if you are parked at a park and ride um, out in Lawrenceville and you're carpooling with somebody, you guys know when you're leaving the building, you check this screen and you can tell my, my commute's going to be 30 minutes right now. Um, so they also have the capacity to check this on an app, which they can download on their personal phone and or their business phone. Uh, they also have this capacity online um, to, to check on the net before they ever leave the office if they choose. But it is, it is, spec it is specifically um, downloaded real time for their location. So it tells you when the next train is going to arrive. So do I need to run from the lobby to the platform or can I do I have a couple minutes to get up there? Um, it has the bus route schedule. There's a bus stop right in front of our location at building two to uh, run the routes there. So they know when that's coming. And they also have express buses that are coming directly now into the Dunwoody station. When we first arrived in the area, we only had one direct route bus coming into perimeter. And through lots of years of conversations, uh, we were able to work with uh, Greta and with the express bus system to uh, now have five direct route buses coming into the perimeter area. So that's been a tremendous help for our employees. So um, last but not least, when we get through all this, what, it, what has this done for State Farm and the community and how has this impacted us? So we, we previously had, and we still have a low
Michelle, are you able to hear me? I think your audio cut out and your video froze. Well, while Michelle is um, getting logged back in, I'm going to, um, I believe that was her. She had one more slide that she was going to um, talk about really the demographics that they've um, been able to kind of pull from um, and how they've been able to expand kind of their reach with, with regards to kind of pulling some of the uh, talent from the Atlanta metro region. Um, the slide on the left is going to be the new demographics that they've, uh, the new demographics since relocating to the, the perimeter center location. As the graph on the right is going to, is their older one where their uh, hub was in Johns Creek and not as connected to transit. So one of the, the things that Michelle and I have definitely talked about before is their ability, they, State Farm's ability to be able to really diversify and expand their, um, their reach and their talent pool um, and make their organization more diverse, which has added value across the board. So I'm um, very glad to be able to talk about that and hopefully we'll be able to um, get Michelle back on the call. But in the meantime, I'm going to dive into our questions. Um, again, our topics that we'll be talking about is uh, traffic in the pandemic, multimodal transportation, and workforce commute. Michelle, glad to have you back on. I, I shared a little bit about your last slide, um, so we'll definitely be able to talk about that. That's one of the questions that we talk about is, is uh, diversity in workforce. So uh, the first question is actually to Michelle and uh, Kristen. Um, the pandemic has had a big impact on Atlanta traffic, uh, with it down as much as 50% several months ago, but with it down as much as 50%. Um, many continue working from home to some degree, despite the, that traffic is still uh, approaching normal levels at this time, uh, largely due to the increase of, of freight traffic. Uh, many businesses plan to bring staff back to the office um, between now and 2021. Um, but I wanted to know, um, in your opinion, or really um, from your work, uh, can businesses coordinate office reopenings to help address Atlanta's historic traffic problem? Um, if so, how? Um, in particularly around returning to the office from the pandemic. And I will, Kristen, I'll call you. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> no. I wanna speak over Michelle. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think that coordination can happen. I think the, again, one of the silver linings of the, of the pandemic is the fact that a lot of companies and businesses that were a little bit wary of, uh, you know, some of those other options like teleworking, um, you know, and some of that technology, uh, they've kind of been forced to use it over the last several months. Uh, so it's, it's one of those things where I think it, it's, it's been, it's been somewhat positive for some of these companies, because it does show that people can still get their jobs done. Uh, you know, if you have the right uh, tools in place. Um, so I think a coordinated effort is, is possible. Um, I think also just, I think each business are, from what I've heard, most of the larger businesses are going in in phased approaches. So I think just in general, them coordinating themselves and their large business is going to be a good coordinated effort altogether. Um, so I, I do think it's possible. I do think traffic uh, numbers will, will go back up and, and we'll get back to where we were and continue our trajectory, you know, to be uh, uh, super close to gridlock uh, <laughs> you know, 50 years or so, but um but yeah, so I, I do think it's it's had kind of a at least a positive impact on on people's uh, how they think about uh, where their workforce is and how they how their workforce can get things done, even not sitting at their desk in the office. So I think that's been a positive thing, um, and I think it'll it'll be interesting to see what companies uh, continue to do. You know, if they have again this coordinated effort going back, but I think there may uh, be some opportunity for companies to have you know flex work hours at the very least. Um, or even have some work from home days. You know, I know our office is talking about that. We're only three people, um, but we've been able to. You know, we've seen the, we've seen the uh, the ability of our employees to to pivot and to kind of get things done no matter where they're at. So it's been a it's it's been somewhat a positive experience in that particular light. Just that, other things. Yeah, I'll definitely second that. Um, one of the things I do in, in my nine to five is to help companies set up um, telework programs. And that is something that I'm, I'm starting to, to, our organization is, is hearing from many large 
um, employers is that they are looking for some sort of flexibility. And just also from the surveying that we do, a lot of millennials are really interested in that flexibility and they're coming to be the largest work group. So it's, it's, it's I think something that can impact the region and traffic across the region um, as an unintended benefit of the pandemic, if there is ever such a thing. Um, Michelle, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about kind of coordinating reopening efforts um, and how that might impact traffic in Atlanta. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, so obviously, I think it would be beneficial for there to be a coordination between businesses. And I think along with uh, Chris and probably is doing this at the North Fulton, we're doing this with PCID. Um, here in the perimeter area is to talk to the businesses in the other areas uh, surrounding you to see what what everybody is doing. When are you coming back? What does that look like? It has an impact on the small businesses. And in our case, the mall is right there. And um, how do we, you know, work together so that those things can, you know, equate to Small businesses may be able to reopen further and be able to provide more jobs and things of that nature. And it's also impactful to go from zero to 100, right, with traffic in the area. So when you've got about 6,000 people coming into a singular location like we do at our location, that has a huge impact depending on what time of day they're coming in. And we've been able to coordinate efforts in the past with the other businesses in the area for uh, things such as weather related events. So it has been um, very beneficial to work with other businesses in the area and it does reduce traffic issues and congestion problems by allowing our people to still have work from home options moving forward in the future that they may not have had as readily before. It helps us to know, you know, to impact on MARTA and Greta and other things that we utilize in carpooling and come up with some new ideas actually to help with some of the coordination of getting our folks to and fro to work. Yeah, it sounds like um being nimble has to be something, especially the larger the organization, the, the more nimble you have to really be with, with something like this. So yes, Absolutely. thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, a little diving into kind of multimodal transportation. Um, Kristen, would you mind talking about a, um, a little bit the 400 um, Express Lanes project? Um, it's slated to open up, I believe, in 20 but 2027, I believe it is, um, in North Fulton, and it's going to be a game changer. It's going to expand transit and a whole host of other things, especially in conjunction with the um, the bike expansions that'll be connecting to MARTA and, and some of these other paths. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and, and how that might impact or will impact the area? Yeah, it's it's definitely a game changer. Uh, kind of what uh, perimeters experience right now with the door 400-285. A fun construction project, just that little construction project y'all have going down there. Um, so they haven't started construction yet, but uh, like uh, Sam said, I think it's slated for uh, late 2026, early 2027. And that's the express lane project, uh, which I'm sure y'all have heard a lot about a lot of times. Um, but there's also the bus rapid transit, which is uh, coming in coordination. Hopefully, again, that is not that is not funded yet. Um, so that's kind of everyone's crossing their fingers and hope they can make it work. Um, but they are coordinating efforts so that, uh, you know, the bus rapid transit and the express lanes can hopefully come simultaneously and work together uh, to create, you know, this fantastic uh, transportation mobility option up the 400 corridor. Um, so it, it is a obviously for a lot of reasons that y'all can that anyone can come up with. It's a great uh, for mobility transportation options. Um, what we see it as kind of a, a really positive in Will be the economic impact. So for you know economic development, um, a lot of companies when they're looking to relocate, uh, they're looking for those options for their like you said, Sam, their millennials, uh, their new up and coming uh, staff members. They they don't want to be you know they don't want to go live in the Gulf Coast of Georgia and you know drive an hour and a half back and forth to work. Um, you know they they want to be close to to their options. They want to be be able to you know hop on a bus, hop on a train, and and go to dinner, whatever it is, even just walk there. So um, I think it will um, it will hopefully uh, provide that economic impact uh, that we're all uh, very excited about. Um, one of the things that we've been doing is looking at uh, kind, of, kind of those transportation impacts of, okay, the 400 corridor comes up, 
what happens to the traffic patterns, what happens mm -hmm. to those uh, east-west connections. And so that's something that we've been looking at is how can we uh, make sure that we're prepared when it does come up. So that's something that we've been looking at. Um, but again, that economic development impact is probably what we're most excited about. Um, you know, more businesses, more jobs, um, and getting being able to get people to those jobs easier, which is something we've had um, an issue with up in North Fulton, as all of you know. Um, you know, if you go by any of the, the mall or any of the retail stores, um, they actually are, a lot of them are hiring because a lot of their, the people that were uh, working there, they can't get there anymore. So uh, that's something that uh, we've noticed, and so that will hopefully, uh, once the 400 corridor, uh, especially the BRT comes up, uh, we're very excited about the possibilities. Yeah, and I think you make a really good point with um, kind of diving into our next um, kind of question that I'm going to pose really to um, Amelia. What um, impact has providing transportation to your folks really had because it, it seems to be a not just a theme or a reoccurrence with um, in North Fulton it really is across the region it's difficult to get folks to work and that's something that you guys have taken on kind of head on what impact does that had not only um, on your uh, your employees but just from a competitive advantage for being yeah. providing transportation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll address that in a couple different ways. So one, obviously providing transportation, giving somebody access to a previously inaccessible job, both the willingness to hire and the ability to get there is life transformational. I mean, it's opening up opportunities that didn't exist, right? And we've seen that bar none be one of the best things that we do. And when we survey our clients, the individuals we're putting to work, that is rapid job placement and transportation are the two things that set us apart. Um, from a business perspective, to your point, like you said, it's a value add. So we compete against the for-profit staffing guys. We are large enough now. We compete against, you know, Deco, Higher Dynamics, People Ready. Those are our competitors. And when we can tell a potential customer, we've got some really great people. They're really hard workers, and we have proven data on that. But not only do we have people, but we're going to guarantee they show up every day on time. When you have a shift that starts at 11 and you need 10 people, and we can guarantee 12 without fail every time because we have a van that's getting them there. Um, that is a huge ROI for a potential business customer. So we actually have some, um, some really good conversations around the customers that we serve because otherwise, to your point, you've got these businesses for hiring, but people can't physically get there. Um, I think the thing that stands out for me too during some of this conversation I've, I've been thinking, I mean, when you're talking about the virtual work and who can do that and what businesses can do that and what individuals can do that, and then I look at the people that we serve, there's, it's not virtual work. Like without transportation, we can't keep the wheels spinning. You can't sort mail virtually. You can't bake bread virtually. You can't clean an apartment building virtually. You have to get there and do it in person. So what really hit us hard was when MARTA cut back routes because then we had people who could previously depend on MARTA that now we're having to figure out a way to get them to the jobs that they already had. Um, and that was a really big hit to the population that we serve, right? I mean, these are not folks who have a car and if they are one day buying a car, it's probably still a ways off. So they are very dependent on other means of transportation, whether that's carpooling, Georgia commute options is awesome for some of that, or it's public transportation or some one-off thing like we do, which quite honestly is just a pebble, a pebble in a pond. Like, yes, 3,000 rides sounds like a lot, but it really only works out to like two rides per person when we talk about the number of people we send to work. So um, the transportation barrier is really, really critical for the people who are living in the deepest levels of poverty in our community. I'm not talking about the people who could work virtually and like don't want to send traffic for an hour. That sucks. I do it on the regular. I live in Roswell. I work in downtown by Grady. Um, it sucks, but I can make it work. It's the people who legitimately can't earn a living if they don't have a solution and those are some of the solutions I think we should focus on. So can you uh, talk a little bit about the modes of, tra of, tra of travel, excuse me, that you provide for your folks? Yeah, I mean, like I said, we've, um, we're trying to do as much as we can do within bounds of reason. I mean, we do provide free MARTA cards for part of a half year MARTA program. So if that's an option, we want to make sure people can uh, get the MARTA cards and get to them from work. We have that partnership with Uber. We use it as the last you know, resort because it's expensive um, and we want to make sure people are safe. And then we use these enterprise rideshare vans and that has really ramped up. I mean, we started that program after a conversation with Georgia Commute Options and DOT as, as an opportunity, which by the way, any business can use. Like this is not exclusive to First Step. It is not exclusive to nonprofits. It actually started in the government sector in DC. So any company, big, large, small, can utilize this program if they have enough people to fill a vehicle and it can be a car, 
a, you know, minivan up to a 15 passenger van. Um, and it really is an affordable program for people that want to consider that to help their employees get to and from work. But we started with one van and now we run 20. So that has really been the best way we can get people to and from work when we can't utilize public transportation. Yeah, an added benefit to the express lanes um, will be that they're going to be accessible to van pools and, yep. you know, having systems that impact a region can really trickle to everyone. It hopefully, you know, will include adding the, the addition of bus shuttles and, and things that don't just service folks who are working, but also can service, um, you know, our senior population that are also going to be um, experience a lot of these kind of transit and um, mobility problems that everyone has. So um, yeah. it's, it's really, it, again, having transportation as a solution, I think is it impacts the region. Um, pivoting a little bit to talk yeah. about the impact of um, your transportation program, Michelle, would you talk a little bit more in detail about um, the impact that um, relocating to um, an area that gives you access to transit has had on State Farm? Yeah, so Sam, if you could pull up that last slide I had um, from earlier, if you wouldn't mind, that would be great because it's a great graphic. So it's a little busy, um, so sorry about that, but just want you to see the difference in where we were and where we are now. So the slide on your right is our location um, of employees uh, that work in uh, our Johns Creek location at North Fulton. The darker the coloring, the more employees per zip code that we have in that area. So as you can tell from this, really our heaviest population of employees lived um, and lives in um, Forsyth and Gwinnett and some of the North Fulton areas, a little bit into DeKalb County, but mostly Gwinnett and Forsyth um, are coming in to work in this location and they really only have one way to get there, their car. Um, there's not a real opportunity for them to get into, uh, you know, a, a, a train or a bus or anything like that to come and work at our Johns Creek location. Um, a beautiful area. We established that location in 1990 and we're still there today. But if you'll go to the uh, left side of the screen, you can see by locating our employees in the perimeter location um, on, uh, in Dunwoody, how much that expanded uh, out to really all of the major metropolitan counties throughout um, Atlanta. So while we still have a heavy presence from Forsyth and Gwinnett, you can tell by this map we have really expanded out uh, to the southwest area of South Fulton County, Douglas County, Cobb County to the e, uh, to the west, and then a really huge population um, impact out in DeKalb County. So this has really made a huge impact on the diversity uh, demographic of our employees um, coming in to work at State Farm and in large part that's due to their availability to have transportation options coming into the perimeter area, whether that be by rail, going to a park and ride and getting on the express bus, um, or whether it's carpooling, uh, van pooling, whatever options that they've had. Um, the bigger key too is, is that we like to, um, we, we built Park Center as a live, work, play community. So we've seen a huge influx of our employees actually moving into and living closer to the actual building. So what involves with that, that we're still working on as we continue to build that base there is last mile connectivity. And I was mentioning that a little bit ago before I got um, cut off and I apologize for that. I got disconnected internet problems, but um, anyway, um, you know, that last mile connectivity for people is crucial. Um, is there a bus, bus shelter? You know, nobody wants to go get on a bus and go from their apartment or their house to get to work if they have to stand out in the weather, right? It's either hotter than hootie here in the south <laughs> in the middle of summer and the sun's beating down on you or it's raining or it's cold, right? And you don't want to stand out without a bus shelter. So, Kristen, thanks for putting in extra bus shelters out there. It's awesome. 
Um, and so those are just some of the things that we're working on that have had an impact. But you can tell by this demographic map here how much of an influence we're now able to have and to gain employees and attract and retain such a diverse, much more diverse group of employees from all over metropolitan Atlanta, as opposed to when we had less transit opportunity in our Johns Creek location. Thanks, Chris, uh, Sam. No problem, and, and my last question goes to Amelia and Michelle. It's, it's really because you both both your organizations focus so on transportation. Uh, what research helped make the decision to invest in transportation? Um, for State Farm, that's to relocate. And for First Step, that was really just to provide that door-to-door -door transportation. Um, and I'll, Amelia, I'll call on you to go first. Yeah, I think it was pretty simple. We have a line out the door of people who are looking for employment and we have jobs and without a transportation solution, the two can't connect. Um, and the existing solutions didn't solve the problem. So again, that's why we decided to tackle that internally, but we have people, we have jobs and transportation is the link between the two. So, and then again, we've got our research that shows that does in fact help people retain employment. That is a wage increase over time for them. And that is a connection to that self-sufficiency model that we're working towards. Michelle, same question to you. What research um, helped make the decision to, to relocate in your case? Well, um, obviously that was beyond me. Our corporate had a great um, foresight um, several, like several years ago to create these hubs. Um, we tend to make changes of this magnitude based on, you know, what are our policyholders telling us? What are we able to provide to them in a more effective and efficient manner? Um, because we're owned by our policyholders, we're a mutual company, we want to try to keep costs down. Technology has enabled a great deal of that decision-making process to do this. The key is, is once we decided to go to these hub locations was where to locate and transit have a, a part to play in that and the ability for us to attract and retain employees and again transit was key in deciding that obviously among a lot of other factors um, but key one of the key plays was can we connect our people to transportation options um, and being on the MARTA line has been a significant impact as you can see from the demographics of this map I mean I just can't encourage businesses enough if you can't if you can't be right on the rail you, you need to help us impact the ability for your employees to get to that last mile connectivity because over the years of, of talking to our employees surveying our employees working with the PCID and the in um, the North Fulton CID and just MARTA and all of the players that, um, you know, Kristen brought up uh, earlier on one of her slides. When, when you're talking to all of these entities, it's that last mile connectivity. The trails that we're building here in Atlanta have been crucial. Um, at some point, the Path 400 trail will come up into our area. When we built our campus at Park Center, we built in dedicated bike lanes. We built a connectivity um, road between Peachtree and uh, Peachtree Dunwoody and Asher Dunwoody to, to help cut down on that traffic off of Hammond. All of those connectivity um, things and getting people really closer to their job is ideal, but not everybody can afford to do that. And if you can't live where you work, how are you going to get to that job as Amelia was indicating earlier? And we want to be able to do that and coming up with any and all options for transportation to do that is what, what we see as an important and vital thing to attract and retain employees. Well put. And um, it, it's 11 o'clock already, you know, thank you guys so much for um, joining us here today. I'm going to fast forward to some of our, uh, to our last slide, um, just to talk to everyone about North Fulton Improvement Network. So um, INFIN, or the Improvement Network, as Jack calls it, um, really focuses on four areas, um, housing, income, work, food, child well-being, and transportation. Um, this fireside chat today is, is specifically, of course, on transportation. And if you are interested in um, attending any of our monthly meetings or helping with some of our initiatives, we'd love to have you. We'd love you to, to join us and to really kind of assist 
this effort that we're all working in. Um, as you can see, none of these kind of issues work in silos, um, addressing transportation.